Thank you, everybody. On behalf of the College Activities Board, we'd like to welcome you to um, today's event from Memo Street to Pike Street. Uh, today's, this, this event was brought to you by the, um, the College Activities Board and the li Library uh, Social Conversation Series. So for many of you who... Thank you. The Conversations on Social Issues that takes place every Thursday uh, from 12 to 1 in the Library Room A. But for this special event, we've expanded it to hold it in the Broadway Performance Hall because we have some great guests, um, some honored legends in our community. And um, on that note, I just want to thank everybody for showing up. And again, I want to introduce our host, and he's kind of like the, the visionary for this event. He's a faculty member, Dr. Dowdy Abe. What's up, what's up? Thank you for coming. It's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, a couple things. It's a pleasure to be able to uh, celebrate this little gathering in the month of November, which happens to be Hip Hop History Month. Um, but it's also a pleasure to be able to have a stage on the campus of Seattle Central, which uh, has been the site of many historic gatherings and protests and activities and just about anything else that you can think of. So uh, definitely, definitely a, a, an honor and a privilege to be able to, to be a part of a, uh, an event like this. Um, I would just probably briefly say that for me, uh, as a kid growing up in the Central District, my first uh, encounter with hip hop in Seattle anyway, aside from hearing about people like the Animal Street Boys, but an actual encounter with music would have to have been uh, probably, this is going on probably about 83, uh, when my best friend, uh, Michael Hawkins, um, let me listen to a tape by someone that I'd been hearing about uh, named Sir Mix-a-Lot. And this was not exactly, you have to understand that this is in the time before iPods and MP3s, the emergent technology for the, the transmission of music at the time was the, the, the dual tape decks, you know what I'm saying, where you can dub tapes. And, uh, and so, I'll never forget this song, like it was yesterday. And in fact, I even have this tape. I have this tape in my bag in my office, and I was going to bring it as a prop, but I forgot. But, but so, so, the emergent thing was dubbing tapes. And one of the songs that I heard by Mixlot at that time was a song about people who were dubbing his tapes without his permission. You remember that? And I was terrified, because he was calling names. He was calling fat boy named Ronald. And, somebody named Daryl, you know what I'm saying, don't dub my tapes, and he had women singing, and it was like, man, I don't want to be this person who gets caught dubbing this man's tape. So Mike is like, okay, you know, I'm going to dub this tape for you, and I was like, shh, don't say it so loud. So he dubs the tape, and he brings the tape to me. He's like, and I'm not kidding when I tell you this, he's like, so Mike brings me the tape, and he's like, here, I got the tape for you. I was like, no, 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 put it down, just put it down on the table. <laughs> puts the tape down on the tape. And I was like, walk away. He's like, walks away. And then I walk up to the table and I put it in my, that's how, you know what I'm saying, as a young teenager, that's how leery I was about getting caught up being a person who dubbed this man's tape without his permission. So that was my first encounter with actual hip hop music from Seattle. And from that time, it's really only grown and expanded um, as we have all had an opportunity to hear, uh, listen to, see, watch, uh, and observe uh, all of the people that have come uh, and done their thing in subsequent years. Uh, so that's just my little story. And so I, I think that probably since we are working with limited time, without further ado, uh, I'd like to take a moment to, uh, to introduce our esteemed guests. She is an MC, an educator, and an organizer from Seattle, Washington. She reps Alpha Platoon Crew and Autonomous, 
autonomously supports youth, urban arts, and cultural work through hip hop, media production, advocacy, and rabble rousing. She is currently working with 206 Zulu on Our Story, Northwest Hip Hop Heritage Documentation Project, hosting a multi generational monthly MC beat making cypher so showcase called Church at Black Coffee, and working on a new EP. She can be found online at www. Julie, J U L I E C.com. Please welcome Julie C. Okay. He is the author of the My Philosophy column in Seattle's The Stranger since 2004, after the post was vacated by one Mr. Sam Chesno. He hosts Street Sounds every Sunday on KEXP 90.3 FM and manages artists under his company LTD. He can also be considered an artist currently active in the group Don't Talk to the Cops. He has a posse, perhaps several, but is not sure where they are at the moment. Please welcome Larry Mizell Jr. He is a b-boy -B and DJ, originally from Seattle, Washington, who relocated to New York in 1997 and eventually joined the world-famous Rocksteady crew. He is most well-known for his gun-blazing style, which he developed while studying with his mentors Icy Ice and Lil Lep of the New York City Breakers. Please welcome, I know him as Carter, y'all know him as Fever One. Finally, last but not least, he is a DJ, MC, and producer who co-founded Nasty Mix Records along with DJ Nasty Ness Rodriguez in 1986. His 1987 single, Posse on Broadway, was an early example of hip-hop's ability to export elements of Seattle culture to the rest of the world. In 1992, he reached number one on the Billboard chart with the single, Baby Got Back which also earned him the 1993 Grammy Award for Best Solo Rap Performance. He has remained active in the Seattle music scene, collaborating with groups such as Mud Honey and the Presidents of the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Anthony Sir Mix-a-Lot Ray. With a, with a few questions that I've put together here for the panelists, uh, and then we will be opening up the questions for uh, from the audience uh, through Twitter, which you may submit to the hashtag Emerald to Pike. All right? Okay. Um, so for the panel, um, the first question is: I'd like for you. Uh, if you could, to each take a few moments to describe your first interactions with hip hop in Seattle. Uh, Julie, you want to start? Sure. Uh, check, check, please. How are you guys doing today? Woo! Y'all gotta talk back to me. I'm up here with legends, so I'm nervous. You guys feeling all right? <laughs> all right. So for me, um, I've been MC, and I grew up on the east side, actually. And I started emceeing just with my friends, probably around 13, 14 years old. And um, I linked up with a crew called Immaculate Flav. Um, X Kitty was out of Portland at the time. And they helped me put out my first EP. And the first time I really, though, connected, connected with the Seattle scene was when I performed at a Sure Shot Sundays, which was a weekly um, thrown by Jastery Media Group. And I met there. King Chasm, he helped me complete some uh, high school work study credits from the Mad Lab Studios. And uh, Rajni Eddins definitely through poetry experience at Langston Hughes Cultural Arts Center, connected with Alpha P. And um, yeah, that's a little bit of my story. What's up, everybody? Hey. <laughs> um, I encountered Seattle hip hop for the first time going to Franklin High School. Class of 96, Sub King Chasm. This guy right here, um, members of the Boss crew, they were around. Later on, went on to found Massive. I think that's accurate, right? Yeah. 
Um, but the, the, the moment that really stayed with me the most where I was like, whoa, there's, there's, there's hip hop here, there's actually, it's going on, there's a, there's a thing here, was in, it was the year I graduated, 1996. I can't remember what store it was. It might have been what used to be Peaches up in Ballard. And I picked up an uh, album called 14 Fathoms Deep. It was a compilation of Seattle hip hop. It was put out by Loose Groove Records, which was founded by um, Stone Gossard from Pearl Jam. Uh, on this record were Ghetto Children, which is Vitamin D's old group, Source of Labor, you know Jay Moore from Sound Session on Sundays in Cube. Um, uh, he's known as Wordsayer, uh, Beyond Reality, just tons of foundational groups. Um, and then for the next three years, there were compilations that came out um, that, that, that just schooled me to so much stuff going on through the Northwest. And it was then that I realized that there's something real going on here, and I was stuck. That's all I wanted to listen <coughs> to. So that's what that was. Peace, everyone. My name is uh, Fever One. Get this mic check here. So um, my first interactions with hip hop here in Seattle, I would say probably go back to 1979. First hearing Rapper's Delight, you know, on the radio and being exposed to that, and um, just you know hearing something that I've never heard before, just really opened my eyes to um, the musical element of hip hop. Also at the time there were. Uh, Cats that when I was in school, I would actually went to Summit K through 12, which was in the CD, the Central District. Yep. It was the same school that Dowdy went to. Actually, I was a yep. classmate of Dowdy's, um, Dr. Abe. <laughs> and um, at our school, it was a K through 12. Uh, we were like seventh, eighth grade, I believe, seventh grade. And we would go to school with cats that were probably like 19, 20 years old, but they were still finishing up their high school credits. and. Um, at the school, we'd experience popping battles all the time. See, with this alternative school, it was a little bit different than a normal public school, high school, middle school. You'd call your teachers by their first name, you know, hey, Dick, how you doing, Jane? You know, kids would bring, like, the box, you know, the radio to class, play music. People would, like, actually dance in the hallways. And this is the first time I experienced seeing my first, like, popping battle, where heads would, like, go at it and battle each other and popping. Um, this is my first interaction with uh, the dancing element of hip hop. Um, not too long after that, I was exposed to breaking, otherwise known as b-boying or break dancing video. <coughs> um, I picked that up right away, started breaking you know, in 1982. Um, during the same time, a lot of other people in the city were popping and breaking and creating crews. Um, also at the time, Sir Mix a Lot, he was throwing uh, events at the Central District Boys and Girls Club, Boys Club back then. But um, I used to go to that, and I was probably actually one of the only white kids at that party. <laughs> but um, you know, this is really uh, what exposed me to hip hop in Seattle was um, going to these events. Uh, the first time I was exposed uh, to like pop music that you would pop to, it was like funk. You know, it wasn't even like rapping and it wasn't, you know, like what you know was like hip hop music. Today we were dancing to like Ohio players and Zap and, and music like this. And um, I would talk to my friends at school and say, yo, you know how I get my hands on some of this music? And they'd say, yo, you gotta turn on K Fox, 1250 K Fox. You know, they got, this, they got the dopest DJs, C89, they got the dopest DJs and they play cuts all night long. So I went home and turned on the radio, I threw the tape in and just started hitting pause every time I heard a song that I liked. You know? Came to school the next day, threw it in the box, and everyone was like, yo, that's an ill pause mixtape you just made. And I didn't even know what I did. I was just you know, playing music that I wanted to play to, and everyone um, really appreciated that. Um, and you know, we were dancing and stuff, and so like uh, getting back to those radio stations, they used to throw all city jams at uh, the exhibition hall and uh, mix a lot and nasty nest. They used to DJ that a lot. Um, I know you guys had some battles back in the day. I'd let you get into that, but you know th those were the those were the days where um, hip hop really was flourishing at the beginning. You know, in the early '80s here in Seattle, and there was 
hundreds of people, thousands of people, hundreds of crews, DJs, graffiti writers, b-boys, poppers, lockers, any given weekend, you could go either downtown, Seattle Center, and there'll be hundreds of people battling. And so that was, that was my experience. Yeah, it's a lot like mine. Um, I grew up in the Bryant Manor Apartments, 1883 East Yesterday, Apartment D. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and um, what I remember was, I was always into music. You know, I had my little turntable, and like I said, I used to do pause mixes back in the day. I had my little T-Act with the two, two decks on it. And um, I remember loving chic good times. I remember loving craft work. I remember loving all that stuff. But for a kid in the hood, it, it didn't really connect. It wasn't accessible. I didn't feel like I could do it. Um, so then I'm on the bus one day, and I was bussed, right? So I went out to Roosevelt, even though I lived in Gessler, right? So we're on the bus, and this cat used to play music every day. I used to, he used to play that song, the sun. I call your name, girl. Like, damn! And, then, and one day he gets on the bus, and he did his little pause mix, and he came out of Good Times and went into Rapper's Delight. And I'm like, what in the hell is that? Dude's not even singing, right? Because we hadn't heard rap. There was that, so there was no context for it. And um, the next time I heard hip hop was Eddie, who was now known you know, as one of the Emma Street Boys, one of the original cats, was playing a version of Nasty. It was, well, it was Nasty, Grandmaster Flash. And the next time I saw them, they were the Emerald Street Boys, and I'm like, oh my God, that's what we need to do. And they were polished, real talk. And um, there were a lot of, like I said, a lot of battles back then. A lot of beef started, because we were all trying to jock for position. But from my point of view, they were the original real hip hop crew in Seattle, because they actually had it polished down back. And they weren't just rapping, they was dancing they too. Were, they had, saying, and they had a show. Package. Yeah, they had a show. It wasn't like, some of these cats get up and grab their nuts for five minutes. <laughs> no, these cats had a real show, and that was really where I realized I didn't just want to DJ, I wanted to be part of a culture, which is something that gets twisted a lot, is that people see hip hop as just rap. But no, you had cats breaking, you had DJs, you had producers to a certain extent, you had hip, the rappers, and you had graffiti artists. And it was a culture that we were all a part of, and that's where the competitive, competitiveness came from, and that's kind of diluted a little bit now. But still good. Okay. Um, okay, let me get a little bit specific here with our panelists and some of their some of their areas of, of, uh, of expertise. Um, Carter, sorry, Freebird. This is saying it's taking me back to my childhood, so I didn't say that. But I'm in Seattle, I hear my name Carter, I'm in New York, I never hear my name Carter with names so I'm always like either or whatever you come to. Uh, Fever. Uh, in many ways, graffiti was among the first elements of hip hop to get the public's attention. Um, how have you seen graffiti in Seattle grow and change over time? Um, well, graffiti, you know, it's always been, you know, a part of hip hop. Uh, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, back in New York, when you know the early days of hip hop, you had writers that were going to. The same parties that the, the breakers and the b-boys were going to, that the DJs were going to, that the MCs were going to, they're one of the same parties. So a lot of times you would have this interaction where you would have graph writers that were doing the same thing. They were, you know, b-boys who were writing graph. They were MCs that were writing graph. So when you're talking about hip hop, it's kind of like an umbrella of all these different elements. And you wouldn't back then you wouldn't just do one of them. You would try to do a little bit of everything. Um, Going back to like Seattle graph, you know, Seattle is since the early '80s. We were following New York. That was our that was our blueprint. We were like, this is how you have to do it. You know, there was a specific way. There were rules to the game. There were basics. The way you would like, you know, when you do graffiti, for instance, you know, there's basics. You can't just do a crazy letter. You have to learn how to do a solid block letter so it stands on its own so it's the letter then you start adding the arrows and the wild styles and the connections but it has to stand on its own and you know, that's where you get back to the basics of your, your art form so in seattle a lot, we've been studying the basics and the art form of hip-hop for a long time so anything whether it's emceeing djing graph 
you'll see the people who are doing it now, there's a long legacy of uh, generations who've passed down the basics and kept the integrity of the art form. So if you see graffiti now, you see a lot of the pieces, say like most of the legal pieces that you see um, that are commissioned on walls, they're, they're some of the best pieces that you'll see in the world. And the reason because of that is that they follow the basics and they study the rules and you know they are passed down from generation the way it's supposed to be done. So that's my take on like graffiti right now. And, yeah, yeah I, just, I just have to ask a little follow-up question because this is one of the questions that we wrestle with a little bit uh, in the class when we do our unit on graffiti. Uh, there's this question around if, uh, if graffiti is painted on, like you say, one of these commissioned walls, uh, the question arises of whether it's graffiti at all. Um, and so I'm curious about your take on on whether, you know what I'm saying, the whole idea behind graffiti supposed to being, the idea of graffiti being somewhere where it's not supposed to be. Definitely. That makes it graffiti, I'm interested Definitely. in. Definitely, um, well first of all, before like we kind of get in, get off into the whole graffiti thing, the actual original term isn't graffiti, it's writing. And the reason they would call it writing is because they would practice their letters and they would practice writing their name and writing it big and getting it out on trains. And, it would, you know, in New York, they would write their name on a train, do this big piece, and it would go all city, and people from all over the city would be able to see the pieces that people would be putting out there. Um, so getting back to the difference between like graffiti and writing, writing, it has its, its whole foundation of it. You have to know how to do like these basic tags to throw ups, to bubble letters, to straight letters, to wild styles, and you have to understand the um, how it's how it's done. So you know anyone can just run up to the wall and, and just write their name on the wall. Sure, you know that's graffiti. That's defacing property. Um, writing is different. You know you have to you know hone in on your skill. Um, you have to practice your tags over and over and perfect them and get them nice and clean. And um, you know where you decide to put this up, you know really is on you. You know um, there's a lot of rules. People say you know don't tag on churches. You know. Don't you know deface uh, people's proper, public property, not public but private property. Um, don't run up to someone's house and do a tag. You know that's just toy stuff. Some people might even consider tagging up in the bathroom being a toy because you know it's not really you know proving anything. So anyway, just getting back to the whole graffiti, um, whether it's legal, illegal, it really comes back to the skill. Um, and whether you're doing it legally or illegally, it still comes back to writing and what you're doing. Okay. Um, Mix, let me come to you. Um, so you, like many others at that time, start off as a DJ. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the DJ scene in Seattle early on and how that evolved as time passed. That's a good question, because actually, um, to my memory, the DJs kind of took off quicker in Seattle than the actual rappers did. Um, why, I don't know, to tell you the truth, but I remember thinking I was the only DJ in Seattle. And um, I went to this DJ battle and got my ass toasted. <laughs> so I, I saw cats coming out, some dude from West Seattle, man, like, Bruh! I'm like, okay, all right. So um, it, it was, actually it took off pretty quick. Um, maybe it had something to do with guys like Nasty Ness, because what Ness did, and Ness never considered himself like a battle DJ or whatever, but what Ness did, Ness would go to New York about once a month, because he had family there, and he would bring back crates of records, and then he would throw them at me, and then we would do these gigs at the exhibition hall, and we would mix and cut stuff in, and in and out, although Steve Mitchell hated it at, at uh, I almost said Q, damn, <laughs> at K Fox, um, we ended up doing it anyway live. And maybe that had something to do with it. So maybe what people saw, they just said, I want to do that. Right. That's the only thing I can really say. But when hip hop started, when the rap started to kick in, um, you had crews with no DJs. So I was working with cats from the Silver Chain Gang, right? I, I worked with cats from all over the place. Big Boss Cross is like my pimping buddy, right? He's like, I need a DJ, so I'm gonna do stuff. And, and a whole cat, a whole bunch of cats. Um, my boy Jazzy D. Um, I started working with everybody because they're all of a sudden there weren't enough DJs and there were too many rappers. It, um, but to me, the DJ is the glue in hip-hop music. 
Right. And, and that's a great point that you make about Ness because he, on Sunday nights, I mean, he was destination listening on KFOX, you know what I'm saying, with Fresh Tracks and then his little 30-minute master mix, which, and Fresh Tracks was actually the first uh, rap radio show west of the Mississippi, if I'm not mistaken. And let me add one more thing. Ness risked his job to do that. Mm -hmm. See, I was around KFOX back then, and Steve Mitchell was like, dude, you're playing too much of this hippity hippity shit, right? Mm -hmm. And he kept doing it. He would not stop. And I thank him to this day because without Ness, there is no mix line. Right. Right. That's really where I got my chops from. It seems funny to think of a DJ taking a job risk by playing rap on radio. Seems hilarious today, but I mean, this was this was that was the time. Yeah, remember, hip hop, that like graffiti, um, was not considered an art form. It was never really respected. Even when I won my Grammy, this was in 92, I got my Grammy off air. Right. That's right. right. They still weren't telling about it. Yeah, it was like 30 people right. in there. Okay, we're going to do this on camera. Ready? Let's go. Okay. All right. Uh, Larry, if I may come to you. Um, I'm interested in your take on how has and how does local media interacted with hip hop in Seattle. You know, when I when I first encountered media, encountering Seattle hip hop, it was always like, you know, ten people shot at Ice Cube concert at the Paramount. Uh, it was always stuff like that. It was never about stuff that was going on. It was always very outsider, half combative. You know, what is this? Why is it happening? It's a menace. All that. I started to see stuff pop up like when I was in high school. There's, um, and it's still going. Shots to Gordon Curvey, uh, Music Inner City, it's a show that's still going on, showcasing local stuff. Um, but I would read the, all the papers, and none of these people that would ever deign to write about hip hop here ever had any connection to it. And that was very, very weird to me, because I would also read like The Stranger and The Rocket, and you had people like Everett True, who was like elbow deep in the rock scene at the time traveling with you know Kurt Cobain and, and, and everybody and he's writing every week about what's going on and I was just like man why isn't there anything like that and uh, when Sam uh, started doing his column in the tablet RIP um, that was the first time I ever saw somebody I could tell there was a part of what was going on around town that had a perspective on the stuff um, later on uh, Samson Spears who's also um, a story MC from Seattle as part of Twenty well, Second Precinct. Is that right? Yeah, he was on that Fourteen Fathoms Deep comp. Uh, he started writing that column. I started writing for the tablet, and um, yeah, I don't know. To this day, that's still kind of a, a seesaw. There's people kind of poking at it. You know, what is this animal? And, and trying to put their own their own take on what it is their own narrative of what the, the hip hop scene is. And I think it's very important that uh, people that actually do it here, you know, speak up against that and don't let people turn it into their bonsai tree and clip it and say, this is what it's about. It's super happy, it's super nice, it's super safe, it's whatever, you know. It, it should reflect what's really going on. Now though, it's different. There's so many people who want to talk about it because it's the most popular musical form in town by far. I think we could all agree to that. Um, so, like in 2006, I started a blog called Raindrop Hustle. It. That was, I believe, the first blog that ever focused exclusively on Seattle rap. Now there's probably dozens. There's people in New York writing about Seattle hip hop. So that's very gratifying, and, that, and that's just got to keep rolling. So everybody here that wants to chronicle that, you should step up, do it. You know, let your voice be heard because. Otherwise, people are going to try to say it is it, would, it, it is something it wasn't or isn't. So that's very important when, when things become history. Who was telling that story? So have you moved from your level of dissatisfaction before with regard to how how the, the scene is covered before to, to to where it's at now? I would say so. I, I I'm not always happy. I'm always, uh, I, there, there's cats I wish wouldn't write about it at times for sure, but. Uh, now I feel like there's there's much more balance and there's more people knowledgeable enough to call it out. Um, that that yeah, it's a lot better than it used to be, for sure. Okay. All right, Julie. 
Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about uh, how hip hop and activism have shaped each other in Seattle you know, over I'm the so, years. I was so mad at you for this question when I saw it because that's such a huge, huge question. That's so, okay, we got time. <laughs> I want to start off by first defining how I perceive activism to be. And to me, real activism is acts of self determination, empowerment in the face of marginalization, oppression, be it social, economic, racial, what have you. And so, from that angle, hip hop has always been that. And um, the voice of the voiceless, the outlet of expression, um, a place to exert power coming from this cultural legacy of black music and black struggle, which are very much intertwined. And so, you know, as a um, art form, because of that, due to that, it was not always accepted. So I would say, you know, from the very jump, when we talk about people like Nasty Ness, you're talking about media activism. You're talking about somebody giving a platform to expand the audience of um, people who are being unheard and you know, youth that are being unsung and what, what have you. And so um, I wanted to acknowledge that. And I think that when we talk about that um, cultural work as activism, it's an interesting story I've learned through doing um, the Our Story Hip Hop Heritage Project that I'm working on with 206 Zulu in that um, Nasty Ness's story, his personal story is also connected to another form of uh, cultural activism in that he was one of the youngest students to attend and be um, a part of Bruce Lee's school. And so I found that really interesting because I was thinking about you know radical innovation like Bruce Lee did in his art form, but not just that, but also as far as the mainstream goes, changing the perception of Asian American men you know, in popular media, that was tremendous. And I look at what you know, nasty, nasty mix was and what Nasty Ness did. And that was really, to me, very parallel because not only did he provide this platform for this unaccepted, you know, risking his livelihood to um, put these voices on, but also he really, he brought the term Pinoy, you know, to mainstream media. And I think that that's, um, I think that set the stage tremendously. We don't speak a lot about that, but I think that what Ness did in being um, a figure he really contributed to the evolution of very strong, uh, culturally aware, very critical, and extremely political, active artist uh, community of Filipino artists. And um, groups like Isama Mahal, which I think started in 1997, you know, where you've got people like uh, Frida Mala, Geologica Blue Scholars, um, Angela D of Youth Speaks, Rogue Kanai, Kanai Sa, you know, these organizations. Seattle, Seattle has had a huge role, not just locally, but I think in the international movement, galvanizing the uh, Filipino diaspora around um, against colonization and neo-colonization of the homeland. And I think that that's, um, that's one major thing. Uh, apologies, by the way, for reading. I really wanted to you know, make sure I covered the points that I did. Um, I also wanted to bring it back to um, you know, hip hop. Hip hop is black music, black culture. And um, I think that oftentimes what's not spoken about when we talk about the evolution of hip hop in Seattle is the impact the decades of black radical organizing um, from Garveyites and Black Panthers and various Islamic influenced groups, what impact that had on the shaping of the hip hop communities and hip hop activism that we see here. I don't know if you guys uh, were paying attention to the news the last couple of days about what's going on at Horseman School and the um, militarized eviction of Africa Town. Did you guys see that at the front page of the paper? Yeah. So it's, and that's really a continuation. Um, Charles Mudede, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He called the Central District pocket of hip hop the second wave after uh, Sir mix a -Lot. And so um, what he was talking about was a group of artists that emerged from there. We had Source of Labor, Just Theory Media Group, Ghetto Children, um, Fourth Party, Blind Council, and Black Anger. And he, it's spoken a lot about the um, Afrocentric aesthetic of this music. It's spoken a lot about the content, Afrocentric content of this music. But I think that um, what's not talked about is this backdrop and this community of artists that were very much networked and galvanized through this legacy of Pan-African organizing and through black empowerment. And uh, many of these connections were not just you know personal, they were multi-generational. When I interviewed a Kindu from Black Anger, he spoke about how he knew Jace who's currently um, part of a group called Black Stacks. If you haven't heard it, you should check it out. Um, not you know, from his music, but from his, his uh, late father who's passed, who was a very well-known organizer in the community. And I think that these stories and this background behind the music, they remain untold because 
these struggles are continuing to this day. You know, we saw the recent manifestation two days ago, you know. And, and politics get messy when we talk about activism. And on top of that, the term activism has been commodified by the nonprofit industrial complex. And so what we have is this you know, huge industry of that in Seattle. And so things get complicated and things get confusing. And when things aren't clear cut and dry, it's easier to focus on the art and focus on the music. But there are these tremendously important stories that we have to start to examine. Um, one of the most, and I'll, I'll just end with this one, but one of the, um, one of the stories that I uh, have been working on as a part of the, have been working on documenting as a part of our story, is uh, the occupation of Coleman School, which is now the site of the Northwest African American Museum. Um, it's one of the, if not the, longest documented cases of civil dis disobedience in this country. Eight years, they, um, Omar and Tahir and a group of activists occupied a Coleman School to establish an African American Heritage Museum and Cultural Center. And the idea was that this would be community owned and community operated. And um, the, so the museums had a youth action council, uh, youth action committee which was comprised of largely hip-hop artists. You had um, Merciful from Dread Eye, uh, White King was a hip-hop organizer from the Moses Peace Center. He was um, Omari's son. And then you had uh, Gregory Lewis, who does All Power to the Positive Radio, works with Chua Six Zulu a lot. They were running programs and teaching classes, hip-hop classes. They founded 206 Cop Watch in the portables in the back of this building. And similar to what happened two days ago in the Central District of Horseman School, there was also, in I think 1998, a very militarized eviction of the occupants of Coleman School. And um, they also had the SWAT team come in. They had FBI as well. They had um, a mini tank rolling down the street in the Central District. And, um, this was all to get out activists from a building. And so, um, you know, even though, even though there is, you know, now there exists a museum, it is safe to say that, you know, this project was appropriated. Even though it was the Urban League that now owns it, even though it's a black organization, I think it is safe to say that they do not have the interests of the most marginalized people of the community um, at heart. And I think that is evidenced by the fact that there was the first executive director of that museum was an ex-FBI agent with no experience in museum curation. I think it's also evidenced by the lack of radical black organizing history in that museum. And um, I could go on, but my I say all this to say that, that this legacy of um, real activism and real struggle has been intertwined with hip hop in this region um, for a long time. But I think in order to preserve its authenticity and to really fulfill the potential, because we you know hip hop has a very powerful potential to create very powerful, very potent, very tangible change. But in order to really do that, we have to really stick collectively and look holistically at this history, not just from the arts perspective, but from the socioeconomic, you know, the type of work that Jeff Chang might have done in New York. You know what I mean? We need that here because we need to start analyzing it collectively and moving collectively in order to start making the differences that we really can. And, uh, yeah. And that's, that's, that's great, great stuff. I just, I just want to follow up on one thing that you said. I mean, all of it was great, but the one, the one term that you, that you put out there that I'm really interested in hearing, just, if you could, just, just very quickly, uh, the idea of the nonprofit industrial complex. Can you talk just a, just a little bit about that? So, you know, nonprofits, I, could, I wish I had reviewed this history, but a large part of the reason why the nonprofit complex is it is, is, it is now was to quash a lot of the radical energies of, of people who wanted to create change, you know, back in the 60s, 70s. Now they were able to um, have careers and, you know, career activists. And it's, you know, people, I don't want to just bash it. People can do good work in nonprofits. And a whole huge part of the local hip hop industry that is not accounted for is um, the teaching artist, the teaching artist sector. So many hip hop artists contract with nonprofits in the city, and I don't think that that's a bad thing. But I don't think that shifts power in the city, and I, don't, I think that that's what we really need to see happening is um, us to come together and create our own and to make our own moves. Because so long as you know all the work is dispersed and pocketed and separated and all of our perspectives are just narrow, we can't 
broaden out to see it all holistically. That it's going to be, you know, the same people's energy is going to be wasted running the next grant and trying to get the next funding source, and no real, no real changes made. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Let me uh, let me bring it back to, uh, to to Carter right quick. Uh, this is kind of a two-part question here. Um, if you could, please discuss your perspective on the development of B-Boys and B-Girls in Seattle. And secondly, what was it like to be a B-Boy from Seattle in New York City with the Rocksteady crew? All right. Um, well, first, I guess I have to go a little bit back um, on my history. Um, like I said, I started breaking in 82 um, and kept on going all the way up until now. I never really stopped. But, you know, just like um, hip hop in general, it went through a lot of different changes. Um, when we were first exploring hip hop and we were following the New York's like kind of blueprint of how it was done with the graffiti and the DJing and the emceeing and the dancing. Um, after, you know, the, it started going on for a while, I would say like the more uh, gangster side of like hip hop was starting to get more uh, popular and a lot of people were kind of going from one uh, extreme to another extreme. So for instance, you had a lot of people who were building and, and uh, creating all these skills um, started kind of fading away from that and going into maybe something that was a little more, uh, I would say negative, you know, like say for instance, getting involved with gangs and selling drugs and you know, a lot of that stuff was going on definitely in the early 80s, you know, the drugs and gangs and everything, but, you know, once the media started kind of promoting that, everyone kind of jumped on the bandwagon, so to speak. So you had all these people that, you know, one year they were like, yo, I've got skills, you know, blah, 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 to, you know, selling rocks at school, you know, and so there was a big change that went through hip hop and a lot of people stopped, um, you know, kind of giving the, recognition that it kind of actually deserved. A lot of people started kind of just saying, ah, it's played out, you know, no one does that anymore. But there was a lot of people that kept doing it because that was something that they've always done. I was one of those people. So through the late 80s to the early 90s, um, me and a couple other heads, we kept going and uh, we started getting involved in middle school, started going to like Mercer Middle School up in uh, the Beacon Hill area. Um, started getting involved with Jefferson Community Center. Just started going to these schools and trying to reach out to younger, to the youth um, who had these older brothers and sisters that were following these negative uh, stereotypes, you know, getting into gangs. And there was a lot of shootings going on in schools. Middle schools and high schools, like innocent kids just getting shot for no reason. It's ridiculous, you know? So uh, we felt the need to kind of go back into the schools and go back into the community and um, bring hip hop and what it had to offer. Um, a lot of people, you know, look at hip hop and say, you know, it took violence out of the ghetto or whatever, you know, when it first started in New York. Um, it came from the gang culture and it, it did stop a lot of violence, but violence has always been there, you know. It, it wasn't like, hey, let's go break dance and be friends and hold hands and, you know, everyone's peace, you know. It was never really like that. But at the same time, it did have a positive um, road. It did have something that you could actually, you know, make a living off of and, and you know, give back to the community. So we started giving back to the community um, and a lot of these younger brothers and sisters um, are now known as like the massive monkeys that uh, are world champion b-boys right now. They won two world championships, uh, one in Korea, one in the UK. Um, and so, you know, just as far as the development of b-boying in Seattle really comes from just studying the, the foundation of the dance and just staying with it. And that's why the dancers, a lot of the dancers that you see and b-boys and b-girls and poppers and lockers in Seattle, they have that that very um, authentic look, you know, they have that authentic feel. Even though Seattle has its own style, they have the, the uh, blueprint in the way you do it. And then going back to the second part of the question, I'm trying to make it quick, is that um, being from Seattle is just bugged out. Anywhere you go, like I was in New York and everyone thought that I was from New York just by the way that I danced. 
you know, I would just go and rep in the cipher and, you know, call somebody out and, and do my thing. And all these, like, cats from the 80s, these old school cats were like, yo, dude, where are you from? i never seen you before. I was like, yeah, I'm from Seattle. They're like, what? <laughs> Damn, I'm from Seattle. What? You know, Sir Mix a lot. You know, the first thing, Sir Mix a lot. And it's like, yeah, you know, but it's, it's dope to be able to have that. You know, it's dope to be able to be like, yeah, that's right, Sir Mix a lot. You know who that is. And, and people will be like, yeah, Seattle, Washington, D.C. <laughs> Crazy. But I think that um, one thing that I can't say about Seattle that's very special is um, our weather. And what a lot of people don't realize about this city and our weather and the way we kind of just rock and do things, um, it gives us an opportunity to go and work and hone in on our skills. And a lot of people just kind of get in the lab and they work and they work and they work and they work. And then when springtime comes around, everyone just goes nuts. You know, they want to come out with all the fresh gear. They want to come out with all the new skills. And you know, that's really why I believe. You know, you know, going all the way back probably to you know Ray Charles, Jimi Hendrix, and, and why um, Seattle has such a uh, diverse and huge um, you know, musical and art presence is just because of where we're just sitting in the Northwest. You know, in between these mountain ranges with water, you know, surrounding us, the weather allowing us to just to build and hone in on our skills and just wanting to be heard. You know, we're way out here and, you know, it, it's hard to get heard, you know, way up in this corner. Mm -hmm. And we're finally, finally just starting to make, you know, I mean, Mix a Lot, he, he made an earthquake, you know, people all over the world knew about Seattle because of Mix a Lot. Now, you know, people like Macklemore, people like Jake One, people like, you know, Larry and don't talk to the cops and bless one, you know, are, are starting to make these like same kind of, you know, waves and effects all over the world. So, um, you know, Seattle's is coming up and, you know, just like Atlanta, just like LA, just like Miami, just like all the other places that have their own scene. And you know, watch out, Seattle's is coming up. All right. Uh, okay, next let me bring it back to you. Uh, this is a little bit similar to, to what I was getting at here with Carter about that, but uh, it's also a two-parter. Uh, so given the attitudes at the time, uh, what was it like being the first national hip-hop figure from Seattle? When I say attitudes, I'm talking about, you know what I mean, uh, people from the rest of the country looking at, like Carter was just saying, looking at Seattle. When I was... <laughs> And I was in, I, I was actually in New York a couple of weeks ago giving a little book talk. And when I stood up there, you know, people, everybody at this conference that was the same, you know, speaking with, talking about where they were from. So I got up and I was like, yeah, I'm from, from Seattle, you know, AKA Southern Alaska to most of you folks. And that got a big laugh out of the room because honestly, you know what I'm saying? I think that's the way that a lot of people geographically look at us kind of tucked away up in kind of this little corner of the country. So given, some of those attitudes. Um, what was it? So the first part, what was it like being the first national hip hop figure from Seattle? And part two, could we hear your best Grammy story? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you might not like the Grammy story, but uh, it, was, it was kind of strange, because I remember um, we, back in the day, even though hip hop was, has always been competitive, um, when I started to blossom with like Posse and Broadway and, and uh, my hoop team, you didn't have different, I'm gonna say, I'm trying to be careful here, but you didn't have cats in the game that sole purpose was to destroy another cat's career. Right. You know, they were haters to the max, and you still have them, but you know, cats think they're superior intellectually, so they basically right. all mix about that silly shit, that kind of thing. But what, so I went on this tour, that was weird. Now check this list out. Public Enemy, NWA, Ice-T, Sir Mix-a-Lot, that's a Sonic MC Hammer. Can I, can I still get tickets for that? Yeah. Man, and you know, back then, now you could do that to her now, somebody's getting killed, right? Yeah. But I, I remember um, sitting on a bus with Chuck, because Chuck's like a hero of mine, seriously, real talk. I can't give me more knowledge than anybody in this game, he and Ice T. I swear by that, taught me how to interview and everything. But I remember Chuck going, and they still ride horses in Seattle? <laughs> <laughs> I got that a lot. It was like, you know, so what I realized is that I had to not necessarily come off defensive, but I realized that I had to defend Seattle 
to the death, yeah. or else <laughs> hip hop would die. Right. Not that I thought I could keep hip hop alive, right. but if I was the only thing they saw, I had to first let them know that no, I don't define the Seattle sound, because I never said that, that's a myth. So I don't define the Seattle sound, there are cats, if you want that hard shit, they got it. You know what I mean? I had to defend my town fiercely, and slowly but surely we started to take it seriously. Um, and that, then fast forward to the Grammys. I remember Jodeci were the ones that gave me my Grammy. And um, I gotta be careful because there's phones and shit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that there was a, there were a couple of looks, you know, kind of like, well, we're all grown, right? Kind of like, you know, this motherfucker don't deserve no right? <laughs> 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 from fucking Seattle, we ain't from New York, right? And so I, I remember that feeling um, that I got. So the first thing I said in my thank yous, and I made sure I said it with emphasis, that I wanted to thank the Northwest Corner, C-Town for life. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, you know, and I, and I, and I, I, I came along, my peak was right around when grunge beat. Mm -hmm. And I remember at those Grammys, there were a few big acts, big grunge acts, who said that if any one of us win a Grammy, let's collectively say we're not grunge. I was like, what? <laughs> it's like that's what made Seattle cool, was you had cats wearing flannel shirts in LA right. trying to act like grunge, and I was like, this is suicide. Right. The only group that wasn't that way was Pearl Jam. Which one lasted? Thank you very much. So I, I um, one thing I wouldn't do, I would never be ashamed of my town. Right. And I was like, I was adamant about that. It took a while, but now cats are checking. I mean, you know, I know Jonathan from Source of Labor, that cat's well respected. Every cat, every everybody on this panel, well respected. Not because of me, right. but because they took advantage of maybe some light that I may have put on the city. Right. They took advantage of it and ran with it. And that's what I tell people right now when they try to get me to hit on Macklemore. Macklemore's taking your right. What? <laughs> I don't own this city. You know what I mean? It's like, but he has the light on the city again. And I love the fact that a lot of MCs are taking advantage of that attention as opposed to trying to shoot him down because right. that does not work. Right. So, I agree. I think that I think that uh, I think that you. So I, I I left to go to college. I graduated from Garfield in, in '88. I left to go to college down in the Bay Area, right about right in the fall of '88. And I'll never forget going to a party. I think this was at where was it? Was it Stanford? It, anyway, it was somewhere, some college party. And you gotta be smart to get an party. Well, no, I was I wasn't I was a visitor. Believe me, I wasn't a school I went to. Um, and I remember being at the party, and I remember the, the dance floor being empty. And then, because I don't remember what song was playing. And then I remember this real familiar beginning to this song. Ding, 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 ding. And I was like, wait a minute. And so that was Posse on Broadway being played. And I saw a song, I was like, wait a minute. How does this DJ at this party know about this song? And so that was, my shock even was even more so when <laughs> The dance floor that had been empty, when that song comes on, the people in the party are like, oh, putting their hands up and the dance floor gets full. I should just say that because outside of Seattle, the first area that took a liking to that song was the Bay Area. Right. They thought it was their track. Right. I, mean, I, I was just in San Francisco when I did that song. They think I'm talking about San Francisco. Right. Every, every town has a Broadway. Right, yeah, exactly. But I, I didn't know that. I was right. talking about, and it's funny because like, I remember Ice-T coming to town one time and saying, dude, take me up on Vicks. I want to try those rocks. Exactly. I was like, wow. That's what I was just about to say. So I'm at this party, and then, you know, so and I'm going to school, and when people start to find out that I'm from Seattle, they're like, yo, what's Broadway like? Huh? <laughs> yo, are, are, are the burgers and dicks good? Huh? How do you even know about this? But now, kind of looking back on it, that's what I was saying about Hip hop's ability to export culture, you know what I'm saying? That song gave people a like, because it, it, it's always been talk about who you are and what it's like where you're from. And let me say this too, because um, I agree with what was said earlier about hip hop kind of having a sense of activism, but keep in mind the era in which I started, we were merely trying to get noticed. Right. Um, it, like I said, it was just starting to solidify as an art form. So we were trying to get noticed. And we knew that there would be a, uh, you know, the baton would get handed and it would continue to grow. But just like rock and roll started with the same three chords over and over and over and over, mm -hmm. and over 
and then it graduated into what we had in the 60s, right? So the same thing happened with hip hop. So when, as it started to evolve, and as you know, the cats like PE and these guys started to max, I fell in love with it. And I think some people think that I was sitting at home going, oh no, I'm over it. No, man, I love the culture, man. It's more important to me, it's bigger than me. Right. I right. love that shit. Right. Okay, uh, so let me, let me throw a few questions out here uh, to all of you. Uh, and there's no particular order. You can just jump in and just kind of kind of give your piece. I'm interested in uh, some of your thoughts about uh, uh, how, how have uh, women helped shape the hip-hop scene here in Seattle? Um, you know, early on, like I, like I talked about when I first discovered hip hop, there was hip hop music that was being made here. Uh, Beyond Reality was a part of that. Piece of Soul, if you know Laura Peace, Kelly, and her partner, Mary So, um, So right away I knew, you know, the women were an integral part of it. My favorite moment on that whole compilation, in fact, is somebody singing uh, 206's In My Mix. I don't know why nobody's ever sampled that. Uh, what was that before? Infinite song, maybe. I, I don't remember. But uh, that's always been the case. And uh, I know Kylea from Beyond Reality has always been a super inspiration to everybody, including lots of young ladies in Seattle. I remember talking, I interviewed uh, Be Satisfaction, I asked Dawson Cat about that. And they were like, yeah, that was huge, seeing a, a, a black woman on stage, like killing, repping, you know, just bad as hell. So that's always been a presence. And uh, an underappreciated one, just as it has been nationally, uh, but definitely it's been a big part of it here too. And, and the B-girl culture, of course, as well. I don't know if anybody wants to speak to that, Asher. Yeah, I was gonna, just to add on to that, I, I, I definitely second that. As for me, uh, a young MC being 14, 15, seeing, seeing Kalia there, like at the show shot, listening to my lyrics, and you know, being the MC that she was, and creating the types of spaces that she was in Seattle at that time, um, was really, that was really powerful for me. Spicy, um, Alyssa, uh, she goes by now, but um, she was the first woman I ever saw in a battle. Um, and I also wanted to add to that, I think a woman that we, we tend to forget in the scene a lot in Seattle is Dove, who used to be the editor yes. of Seasabot. Yes. And that woman, she did the most, I mean, I think comprehensive just documentation for a very long time of the scene. Um, I was collaborating with Davey D down in the Bay and, and making sure that, you know, the underground seats were connected and connected the dots like that. And I think that, um, you know, as far as the media goes, she was holding it down for a long time before she moved. We lost her to New York, but uh, I wanted to give it up for her, too. Yeah, real quick, I'll jump in here real quick. Um, yeah, Dub was an integral part of everything that was happening in hip-hop. I remember that. And she was... My counterbalance. I ain't gonna lie, there was some times I was going off the deep end. Like, I like big titties, I like big titties, like that. And she's like, you're a lot smarter than that. Cut that shit out. And so she, she kind of checked me a lot, and I love her for that. Um, but I'll say this, there were a lot of women early on. I'm not really talking about, you know, I had Black Sapphire's a good friend of mine. You know, she's like, she's incredible. But there were a lot of women early on that were integral parts of my career who did behind the scene things in this game that they don't get appreciated. Um, I had a, a young lady that actually was acting as my road manager, even though she technically wasn't, who for five years kept me completely organized. She understood this game from top to bottom. And um, although she was well compensated, she didn't get a lot of credit for it. Um, so sometimes cats listen to us and they think, well, I want to be a star, but the real stars are the ones behind the stars. If we flash, we're out. But if you have those kind of skills, you last forever. So. I just wanted to say that, that the behind the scenes girls. Christy, Christy if you out there listening, that's my baby girl. She's right. incredible. I tried to hit, but I couldn't. Nope. <laughs> and I wanted to add one more thing. I think also um, women, women have been very integral in bringing hip hop uh, to, to the classrooms. And the hip hop education you know, thing is something that sort of happened organically, I think, all over the country, but definitely very strongly in Seattle where um, we have, you know, hip hop being taught either as a part of the after school program, as a supplement through, you know, different organizations. I think Laura Peace was huge in that, in um, this, this area. She was, I think, easily to say a pioneer um, in the teaching artist movement out here. And um, I think, like DJ B-Girl as well, founded Project Mayhem, which is a crew um, 
foot traffic was a regular event that went on for a while downtown and a lot of people you know got their start there and got to touch my step for the first time um, this is of course a little bit later on what we have been talking about but uh, also uh, ladies first is um, a space that was organized by onion um, at, at uh, at Hidmo, and um, so I gotta give it up to all the, all the, there's so many like women like Rawa, um, got Bean over there, holding it down up. So, I mean, I think there's a lot, I guess. All right. Okay, so bear with me here, because this, this is this is this kind of a lengthy question, but I, I've been, it's something I've been, I've been writing a little bit about, and I've actually been posing this, this question to, to several people and just just to, to, to kind of get a sense so so bear with me this is a, this is a little bit of a lengthy question but you'll, you'll see where i'm going with this so if we think back in history uh you might say that early american history you know what i mean might have been uh basically a subculture of british culture because you know what i'm saying it was settled by people that came from that area of the world until at some point American culture matured to the extent where it was no longer a subculture and stood up on its own as a culture. Uh, in a similar way, hip hop culture starts as a subculture of African American culture. Um, and then at some point, probably in the early to mid 1980s, uh, it, it stops being a subculture and stands up as a subculture uh, on its own. And I think maybe me and Larry we talked a little bit about this on, on the show a few weeks back. Um, so now, if we say that uh, somebody like Macklemore, uh, who has risen to massive levels of popularity um, by uh, making songs that kind of go against the, some of the mainstream beliefs in rap, and so if I'm saying that, that, uh, that, that, that Macklemore has a song like Thrift Shop, you know what I'm saying? That, that, that where he's talking about buying clothes at secondhand stores, that goes directly against this mainstream rap notion of bling and jewelry, name brand, name brand clothing, right? And if he also does a, a song like Same Love, which talks about same-sex marriage and homosexuality, not in a derogatory way, that goes directly against the mainstream rap norm of homophobia. So if we have these types of things being done by Macklemore. Is that, in the context of the white hip hop subculture, is that an indication that if someone like Macklemore is able to talk about these subjects in this way, is that an indication that now uh, the white hip hop subculture has graduated and is no longer a subculture, but is now a culture in and of itself? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's an interesting question to wrestle with. And I'm, I'm interested to hear what you all have to say about that. I think yes, absolutely, definitely. There's a, uh, Macklemore is huge. I mean, he's, he's one of the biggest performers out right now, which is crazy. Maybe, you know, he's next to Kanye West, he's next to Jay-Z. I'm waiting for the Obama picture. It's definitely gonna happen. <laughs> um, but you have, uh, I mean, I write about shows and stuff every week. I'm seeing these artists, cats like, uh, Chris Webby or, or, or Sam Adams, just, you don't hear about these people. There's just subculture of, of, of stuff that uh, some people jokingly refer to as white hot. Just very like kind of frat bro oriented, you know, we're, we're drinking beer, we're partying, it's all very feel good, kicking it type stuff. But these cats come to town, sell out rooms, and they just level up, they're in a bigger room. And you never hear about it, they're not part of the mainstream hip hop narrative at all. But that is a scene that's popping, and it's and it's and it's becoming a real force. And I'm not saying that that Macklemore and Ryan Lewis are part of that because very much the anti-materialist, anti-homophobia stance they've taken is very much not in line with some of the stuff I've heard out of that. Unfortunately, when I've been forced to listen to it, um, but it's 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 a growing it's a growing concern, and um, you know I, I think of. And I don't want to just generalize who, who their fans are, but I saw a picture, I'll never forget, of Macklemore and Ryan Lewis playing in Atlanta at an outdoor festival, outdoor show. People as far as the eye can see, 
And every face and arm and hand I saw was 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 very light complected. And I was like, whoa, like they found every white person in Atlanta. How the hell is that? There's no black people at this show in Atlanta, Georgia. This is crazy. So yeah, this is that's a real thing. And I mean, there's there's an air of inevitability about that, just because of the the, the cycle of black music and co-option we all know about, hopefully. Um, so it is what it is. I think that. Do you see that as a bad thing, though? I don't necessarily see it as a bad thing. I see it as a thing, and I, I like to see somebody like Ben Haggerty pushing um, progressive ideas uh, and and owning privilege to the degree that he has uh, with that position in the midst of all that, as long as it's not you know, straight vanilla ice, which he gets that with a lot, but he's not, I think he's a lot more responsible, and a lot of people just try to say he's not from hip-hop. If, if you're from hip-hop in this city, you've, you've known this guy for a long time, so, you know, that's not true. But, um, I don't think it's a bad thing at all, because, and I tell people this all the time, uh, just because hip-hop is, 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 came from, from black music, it doesn't mean that white listeners are invalid. White fans are not invalid. They don't. Their beliefs and concerns are not invalid. They just, perhaps, are <laughs> definitely connected to um, whether they, they process and think about it enough uh, uh, the realities of supremacy and, and everything. So that that it's very complicated. I do feel salty about some aspects of it for sure. But it's a bunch of people listening to music. You know, who knows what they'll take from it and go do themselves. I can't, I can't point to it and say that's, that's an awful thing because there's still other stuff going on, you know? We just gotta push what appeals and what is valid to us. Yeah, I think um, me, um, when, I, when I heard Michael Moore's song, Saint Love, I'm like, about time, honestly. I think it's time for hip hop to mature, grow up. Um, and if you don't like it, you don't like it. Um, it's an interesting point you brought up because I, I deal with that a lot. I get people to talk about that a lot. Um, pop artists don't go and get white fans. No, 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 no. White fans are the masses. When white fans buy whoever's record, they become pop artists. So it's not like when Macklemore went in the studio and said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. There's some white folks. <laughs> Out here, might no hip hop. I mean, we got a lot of white fans. That's why hip hop is legitimized now. Let's be blunt about it. Um, there's, I mean, let's face it. There's a lot of music that only black folks like. My mom used to listen to some. I call it gut bucket blues, right? And I loved it, but don't nobody know who they are, right? I mean, I mean, you know, people know that Muddy Waters is a legend, but you know, you're definitely gonna get twenty thousand screaming white kids in that lunch, right? <laughs> So I, I think it's important, that's why I asked if that's a bad thing. I, I don't think it's a bad thing, um, but I do think that you reach a certain level of fame and there is a certain responsibility to hip hop in itself. And that includes me. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying Macklemore's responsible to do anything. I agree with you. I know Mac, and that cat is a hip hop fan. I mean, Macklemore's not just some cat that got grabbed a mic and went down and sat with a calculator and just figured out how to make a lot of money. He truly loves, loves hip hop. Um, but, there is a responsibility with all of us um, at some point to not listen, give back is such a corny ass phrase that I hate hearing people say, but there are aspects of hip hop that when we put the light on, as, on it as a whole, there are parts of hip hop that need focus. And if these young artists can't get that focus, that is the job of the one who had the light, and, which is why I'm here today. I want to. I want to say, I, I don't think I disagree with, with what uh, was said prior by, by Larry and, and Mix, but I do think that we need to be very careful in this discourse to not collapse the idea of culture or subculture with the idea of the market. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with hip hop being used you know, as um, a tool of economic empowerment. I think that's what happens in a capitalist society. But at the same time, we can't confuse. You know, we've been taught in this country, and in this, this type of economy, where we buy, 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 that we become a part of the culture we want to identify by a purchase, or by listening to some music, or by, and that's not, that's not authentic. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But I'm just saying that I, I, wouldn't, I would not use the word uh, subculture. I would, I would say that, that there's a big difference between a market 
or a, um, even like a sub-community versus a, a culture. And I think that hip hop is inherently, and the way we see it manifesting across the globe is inherently connected to anti-imperialism, anti-commodification um, anti of humans and, and what is produced by humans just by their, you know, beings and you know creative energies or whatever you know we see we see hip hop um, being represented by the Zapatistas you know down um, down south of the border we see it as a huge part of um, you know that uprisings in North Africa and and the Middle East and Egypt and so I, I I think that although you know there is I don't think that there's anything wrong with there being you know a sub genre of hip hop that um, you know why party people want to listen to you know hip hop is about that it's about having fun like that's cool but I wouldn't I wouldn't call that um, a subculture. Um, material possessions obviously I'm qualified to talk about this year one of the horrors right so. Let me, no, really, I'm saying, I'm being serious. When we, when I, uh, I remember when I started getting exotic cars. I'm gonna tell you why I did it. Um, rappers were starting to make money, but we were getting no respect when it came to business. Um, I remember walking into a Mercedes dealership, and um, I was seriously looking at buying a car. And I was looked at like I was there to wash windows. I never would forget how that felt. Um, so I started to go, okay, so there's a double standard in the African American community sometimes, in that when the average white guy, 30 years old, is successful, and he has a nice car, a nice watch, well-spoken, he's considered successful. Sometimes, me and our senior all talked about this, I never will forget that conversation. Sometimes when a brother is successful, if he buys a car, if he's well spoken, if he happens to want to put some fat on his head and get a little more intelligent about business, he's stuck up, he's sold out. I think we have to be careful as a culture not to push out the very ones that can pull us out of the rut we're sometimes in. I just want to say that. And I just wanted to follow up uh, and, and, and with what Julie was saying. And, you know, part of how it seems anyway, and I could be missing some people in between, so certainly you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as I look back at the white rappers over the years, I've always seen, there's always been a very apparent connection somehow to the black aspect of hip hop culture, and that may just involve, you know what I mean, if I'm thinking about the Beastie Boys, I'm thinking about the fact that they were on Def Jam Records, and that they were, you know, always touring with Run DMC, and so there was that connection. If I'm thinking about Vanilla Ice, even though he was roundly criticized as whack and, and busted for biting my man's lyrics right here, um, he, he uh, you know what I'm saying, he still had black dancers behind him, and so he was still trying to give that appearance. If I think about Eminem, you know, obviously his, his, he comes out being produced by Dr. Dre, so there's that that element there, but as I look at Macklemore, he appears to be the first white male MC to really come off in this way, who is embracing his whiteness to this degree. And so that's kind of where where the the idea around uh, subculture gradu graduating to culture comes about, at least as as I'm thinking about it. And so so the idea, and so like I said, if I'm wrong, and there's somebody before Macklemore who has embraced his whiteness in this way. This, this That's well said, actually. It certainly correct me, but it just appears to me uh, that, that 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 is the case. And I think also the fact that he's from Seattle, also, and given the lily white population and image of this city, also adds, you know what I mean, uh, if you want to call it, uh, you know what I'm saying, what would be, what would be, what would be <laughs> street credit, if you want to call it that, for the purposes of this discussion, uh, you know what I'm saying, allows for maybe a little bit more leeway in terms of how he presents himself uh, and also how he's perceived. So, I don't know. Anybody? I think you're totally right. I just want to interject this. Uh, I recently read uh, John Caramonic, I think he writes for the New Yorker, New York Times. He called, he reviewed Macklemore's Madison Square Garden concert recently and called him the first post black pop rap post black. That's what I mean. That's exactly I mean, what I'm saying. That's exactly it's, what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's a pretty abhorrent term, but I understood exactly what he meant. Right. That's exactly right. what you said. 
He doesn't have to have a cosign. He doesn't have to be drape himself in the, right. the cultural mores of, of, of what we understand as, as, as a black musical form. He's doing it. To, he's totally owning whiteness, and, and people are, are, are loving it. And, <laughs> and that's new. That's something that's new. That's something brand we new. hadn't really seen before. Yeah. And that, that was my point by asking that. I'm really comfortable question. with it. I, I, maybe I'm just the, the, the bad apple, but I'm comfortable with it. That's his thing. That's like so much. I'm and comfortable I, with mine. And, and I, right. And I don't think that there's, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say I'm uncomfortable with it. I'm just interested in wrestling with this question because I don't necessarily think, and I'm sorry to keep pushing this. I know Julie doesn't like it, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this idea of where, where, where is there a line between when something stops being a subculture and starts being a, sub, a culture on its own. I don't know where that line is, but apparently we have, we're approaching it if we have not already crossed. I think hip hop is no longer black. Hip hop is, is a music that everybody likes. Yeah, everybody, white, black, male, female, old, young, different countries. It's just, we've blown up. That's what we wanted, right? Yeah. When we started, we wanted that acceptance. Now we have that acceptance. And it seems like we're, we're like, no, 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 no. That's true. It's, if you, you, you want that, you know what I'm saying? It was like when, when Run DMC hit the, you know what I'm saying, yeah. hit with Aerosmith, you know what I'm saying? And on one hand, yeah, you love seeing, if you love hip hop, you love seeing Run DMC up on stage with Aerosmith, but you also hated seeing Run DMC up on, on the stage with Aerosmith. It was, you know what I'm saying? It was a, it, well, it's, it's, it's real complicated. I'm not it? sure if I can articulate it. I, I don't think you hate it because Run DMC brought it back home. Right. So after the after the whole Aerosmith stuff, they brought it back home. They right. made real hip hop. So right. I think as long as it's brought back home and it's kept centered and everybody loves it, no matter what the color it is. Uh, right. Carter, and I, just, I mean, it, a lot of it, a lot of people kind of get twisted as well. I mean, I'm I'm a white guy that you know came up in a predominantly black culture, you know, and it's like that. It's always been like that from the beginning. When you're talking about cats in the Bronx that were breaking in the 70s, there were white kids, you know. Um, you know, you, you're gonna get back to, you know, what's the difference between this movement and like a uh, Mexican movement, you know, Cypress Hill or Kid Frost, you know what I mean? Why is it any different than that? It's not, you know, so it's, it's just music and, you know, that's just one small element of hip hop. You're talking about just one little small piece. You know, you, you go back to the graph, a lot of graph writers were predominantly white. They were hanging out with the same cats in the park and the street jams and the hip hop jams. Same thing with, you know, the early B-boys. You know, they were Puerto Rican, they were Dominican, Cuban, you know. A lot of them looked black, a lot of them looked white. They weren't either or, you know what I mean? So a lot of people just like to put these labels out there. But, you know, to me, hip hop has never been about a color thing, you know. Um, the other thing is that I, I travel the world with my art form. I go, um, I've been all over Japan, Korea, Africa, all over Europe. And so there's, there's no color barrier, you know. You, you go to any of these countries and you got white kids, you got black kids, you got Hispanic kids, you know, all over the whole spectrum, you know. And you go to those places and they don't look at you differently. They look at you for your skills. Anybody in this room over 40 years old remembers the day when hip hop was all black and people who hated hip hop, which was, let's face it, older white guys in Mississippi, said, you will never, well, you'll never get my daughter to come to that bullshit. You know what I mean? And that was what, in, in record labels, when I was with Warner Brothers, when I was with Nasty Mix, we talked about how do we, how do we get our music to that next level? We're at that next level. Embrace it, love it, and make sure that the culture doesn't get diluted because of it. That's that's the art. Is trying to make sure that it doesn't get diluted. I just wanted to add. My, I don't think my contention is with. You know, I I think it's an important discussion. But for me, I think that's what's slippery in the way that it's being framed right now is we're we're talking about this from a very capitalist like industry framework or something wrong with that is just a narrow framework. And that's sort of what I'm getting at. I don't think that, um, I think maybe Macklemore rebranded and found a new market, but I don't think that that it's anything but that, just the changing of perimeters for how you want to buy, how you want to sell. And I think the hip hop exists outside of that buy and sell. And so I guess that's why I'm, you know, 
saying what I'm saying. And, and part of part of my whole thing of thinking about this is thinking about people like Elvis Presley and thinking about how, you know what I'm saying, Elvis was a white guy that kind of appropriated black music style and clothing and then was roundly recognized by the public as the authority on that which was appropriated. And so I'm not necessarily putting back more to that space. I'm just saying that historical precedent is out there. And so as we look, and you know I'm saying, the same thing kind of happened with Eminem when he came out, when you know people were kind of branding him as, you know, is he going to be go down as the greatest rapper of all time and that kind of thing. And so the question, actually the question that we were having or the discussion that was being had in, in some of the classes I was doing at the time was 30, 40, 50 years down the road, will Eminem, this is like 10 years ago when he was first coming out, will Eminem be viewed as the king of rap in a way that Elvis is viewed as the king? I'd love to hear opinions on that. What's that? I'd love to hear some opinions on that. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I, re I really, I, I heard Rakim say this and I totally agree. Rakim said point blank. If he was black, this wouldn't even be a debate. Probably not. Real talk. Probably not. I can't but wrap his ass up. The racial baggage that comes with this country, you know what I'm saying, necessitates, uh, at least in my view, necessitates an examination of the issue. It's an uncomfortable um, question, no. but it's real. I mean, I mean and, I, and I agree with what you're saying, that hip hop is outside. But when I say it, I'm not just talking about money. What I'm saying is that hip hop has been able to change a lot of minds culturally. Granted, some of it is just people buying music to have a good time. But some of these people will look deeper. They'll go, you know, they'll hear A Baby Got Back, which was a pop song, and then they'll listen to the lyrics and they're like, wait a minute. He's talking about Cosmo. He's saying that your definition of normal is right. like ours, and ours right. would be hip hop. And that's right. what I'm saying. So I think hip hop, to a certain extent, can change minds. And the more it reaches the masses, the more we win as a culture, I think. Okay. All right, just a couple more things here, and then we'll open it up uh, for some questions. I'm not exactly sure how we'll do that, but we'll figure it out. Um, just uh, for, for, for the panel, um, how would you describe hip hop in Seattle today? And do you have any idea where you think it might be headed next? Joe? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that the par is so high right now in Seattle. There's so many different artists doing so many innovative things that, you know, if you go, I mean, I don't know, I've done a little bit of traveling, and I always come back to like the skill, the skill set in Seattle is really, is really high. And I think that that's creating that competitiveness. It's creating a really, really dynamic, really, there's some amazing stuff out there. If you guys are hip to it, make sure that you check out some local shows, you know, get to know local artists, because anyone you hear on the radio, there's someone in Seattle doing it better right now. That's true. Seattle is extremely diverse. Our Seattle's hip hop scene is flourishing like crazy. Like it's never been, there's never been this many fans. There's never been this many people clamoring for hip hop music from the city, within the city. Um, the, the aspect of like town pride, it's, it's switched around. That's something that's not always understood because cats were really not repping Seattle like that. I'm not talking about like you mix at all. I'm, I'm, I'm saying just like ground level fans were not like 206, town, space, legal tats, all that shit. You know what I mean? It wasn't like that. Everybody, Seattle's a, a, often a, a city of transplants. I'm from Los Angeles myself, came here when I was like 12. A lot of people would just hold on to that. Nah, I'm from Brooklyn, I'm from LA, I'm from the Bay. They wouldn't rep Seattle, you know what I mean? And what's more essential to hip hop than like pride for your soil. Yep. So that was very lacking for a long time. That getting switched around has been so vital and so important to the hip hop here. And I mean, once that switch got flipped, that polarity got switched, you see what happened. I think it's amazing. I think it's the best it's ever been. I'm really excited to see where it goes. Don't know. We have it all from, I, I liken it, uh, my man Bless, he said, uh, you know, and I, not in a derogatory way, but if you want to tag McLemore with the Elvis thing, you have somebody like Spaz Palaces, they're like, you got everybody from like Elvis to Miles here in this city of like two million people mm -hmm. and everything in between, that's amazing. There's cities with popping scenes that don't have anything like that. So, you know, recognize that. Right. Totally agree. Yeah, um, I'm just gonna go back to the elements. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that Seattle, we are on top of our game. You talk about the B-Boys, we're winning world championships on a world stage. You know, when we're battling 
representing this country. It's not Seattle, we're representing the USA, and we're battling Korea, we're battling Japan, we're battling France, we're battling Italy, and we're winning. Same thing with the DJs, Red Bull Three Styles. We have two champions from Seattle. Was it uh, Four Color Zach? Four Color Zach and um, was it uh, Seen, right? Seen, he's, he's not living here anymore, but he's from Seattle. Um, you know, they're on top of their game. That's a party rocking um, competition. What was that, who else, who else? <laughs> All right, but you know, like as far as like the, the DJing goes, top of the game, we're winning world championships. Um, the graph game is the same. I mean, if you guys have seen around the city, BTM, tagged all over the place, that's all over the world. They're crushing New York right now on an underground graph level. Same thing with DDS, um, the crew that I represent as well. Uh, they're known on an international level as well. Um, and of course, you know, the music scene, you know, speaks for itself. That's the one that, you know, everyone kind of sees on the outside, from looking from the outside in to hip hop. That's what everyone sees is, you know, the MCs, the rap, the radio play, and obviously, you know, we're getting our recognition right now, but it's nothing new. We, we've been top of, on top of our game for a long time now, we're just not getting the recognition. Yeah, I love that. Um, for me, it's, I'm, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take it a little bit different because my first love is the studio. Um, that's what I am, I'm a tech head. I've been running the wire my own studio from day one. Um, don't bring them at all, hardly. Um, I, I've noticed, a fundamental difference in the way artists perceive themselves, first and foremost. What I mean by that is that cats like me, when I came along, it was a little bit different. You know, you submitted a CD or whatever, back then a debt, and they defined you, right? So they would bump all your songs when you had something serious to say. Let's be honest. They would wipe those songs off your record. Mix them out. We need you to be funny, boy. Ten songs straight. That was the way it was back then. What I love about um, where Seattle is now is each of these artists understand that they are now a walking, talking brand. Um, gone are the days when some jock on the radio can define who you are, or some critic can tell people, well, don't buy his records, and it actually works because you can defend yourself right here. And these cats actually get it. Also, I've noticed that the quality of the content has stepped up to levels beyond belief. Um, when I get demos now, they ain't demos. These are mastered tracks where cats know how to mix. Um, cats understand phasing and stuff like that. They understand mixing. And I used to talk to cats about mixing records, and I'd be like, you should add a little compression to blank. Like, What's the compressor, dog? Oh, it's like, wow. But these cats actually get it. And so, you know, they're old school cats like, you know, Kevin Gardner and, and, and Funk Daddy, who were helping to mix cats, and they're really starting to come out with some very, I mean, I listened to a whole style of records day before yesterday. I couldn't find a flaw from a mixing perspective. I could not find a flaw, and that's beautiful. All right, last question. All right, uh, for all, right, within the context of Seattle hip hop, uh, what is your favorite song of all time? Let me go ahead and just, let me just go ahead and say mine. Mine would, well, that's a tie. Uh, mine would have to be Cap Rap. Nobody really knows about cat rap except him and, and equilibrium. So I, I, would, I would put that. And cat rap was good, man. Come on, man. Uh, I, I have that tape. You gotta stay friends because you got a lot of stuff on We're going to go play that tape when, when we get done here. We're going to play that tape. Um, oh, right. So, so, yeah, so yeah, your, 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 your thoughts. Uh, your thoughts about your favorite Seattle song of all time. Set right here. Set right here. Set right here. Come on, I gave you the questions before, and I gave you the questions yesterday. You had lots of time to think about it. No, she gave us this question. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just drop one that just kind of popped into my mind. Um, a lot of you guys might know of um, Supreme, Danny Clavesia. Uh, you know, back then he was making a lot of music, you know, from the mid to late 80s, all the way till now, he's still producing and stuff, but uh, he was working with a group called Incredit Crew. Uh, you know, with Chella Chell and Nerdy B, and they had a, um, a crew was uh, uh, Gemini Records, they had their own record label out in here. And, um, Actually, one of the songs uh, they did was called um, He's Incredible. 
and it was Chelly Chill. She was a female MC, and she rhymed about the DJ who was Nerdy B. And they uh, had the track mastered, but what they did is they sent it off to New York to have it edited by uh, Carlos Barrios, who was doing a lot of these edits in hip hop back in the day. Um, if you're familiar with Mantronics, uh, he did a lot of their edits. And what they would do is they would take these real to real, they would record, you know, on actual tape. Right? And they take the real, the real, and he would take a razor blade and slice it and cut it and chop it up and turn it upside down and it would be, da, 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 you know, and he'd do all these cool edits and he sent it back and um, that was a, a song that I had some really cool uh, edits and engineering on it that came from Seattle. So that was like one of my favorite. Yeah, mine, mine would probably be, um, even though it's, it's an artist I produce, I would be, I would tell him he suck too, but. Um, <laughs> Mine would probably be out of sight, man. He did a song called Witness the Prosecution. And um, this cat is politically on top of his shit. Real talk. And uh, I, I wrote a chorus for him. I said, dude, go on, make up a song. And this cat came back with some stuff on politics and just his take on politics is strictly neutral in the middle. Not meaning he doesn't have an opinion, but he hates both the left and the right. And uh, he, just, he doesn't say it from an activist point of view, but he was a logical, grounded, sound point of view as to why he hates both sides. And uh, that probably my, my favorite local hip hop song of all time, really. Right. Man, <laughs> that's like the toughest thing you could ask me. That's always evolving. Some of the local hip hop that's been made in the last couple of years is some of my favorite music ever. Um, but I, I guess I could just think about the song that like really impacted me and I was like, whoa, this like high level production and, and spinning to me where I was, I really woke up. That would be the ghetto children's courts in, courts in the session. I was floored and I just had, I remember I would probably go to sleep with that thing on repeat. It was like that. I was really obsessed with that whole compilation, that song in particular. I was just amazed by the ghetto children's vibe, just so, so smooth, so, I don't know. Very, very dope shots to Biden and be self and everybody who's ever involved in the ghetto children, that's definitely way, way up there. Okay. All right. Julie said she's not avoiding questions. She's just been holding it for a long time. So she'll be like that. Um, I don't think she wanted to tell her. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Um, but uh, okay, so that that is all for the questions that I have. So could we please give a round of applause for the panel? Uh, I think uh, we'd like to take, uh, I think we have roughly 30 minutes or so left in our allotted time, so why don't we open it up for, for questions. I know that I said that we were having some, some, uh, some, some, some questions submitted through Twitter, uh, but you know how technology goes, so, uh, so we're, we're just going to do it the old-fashioned way. So if I can, uh, you want me to pick people, you want to pick people, how do you want to do this? All right. Well, why don't we? Why don't we? Uh, why don't we go? We'll start from the front. And we'll work our way up. Okay. I got a question. Is there is there a rap group or a rapper in particular that you guys wish you could have seen more from? Whether the group broke up or something happened to them? Is there just somebody? You mean local? Talking about local? No. I mean. In general. Just in general. Is there a group that you think they could have done more if they had more time? I always wanted there to be more music from Biggie. Tribe Called Quest. Ooh, for me, man, that's interesting. Because I, I've always wanted to take like rappers, if I could freeze them at their peak and move them into another era. <laughs> really, I'm serious. Like, if, if I could take the Emerald Street Boys and move them into 1989, 1990, right when pop the pop thing started, and guys like me benefited from the bricks that were laid by the underground cats. I would love to have seen them at that point because I think they were that polished. But rap at that point was so underground that as they became more polished, people kind of turned away at that point. Max, did you see their reunion show a couple years ago? No, I did not. They were raw. They were raw as hell. Really? Yes, they were raw. Ah, they truly. There you go. Very much raw. <laughs> Yeah, those guys, man, I mean, and I know a lot of people say, man, so-so don't like you, whatever, that, that, so what? That was the game back then. Um, 
those guys, to me, if they didn't do what they did, I would have did nothing. Believe that. I knew what was doable then. Yes. This question is for Nick. Aren't you being a little bit disingenuous when you say that you represented Seattle hip hop? Because even on your Swans album, you had a sample where you said where you kind of denied Seattle and you said raised in LA. No, I did not. What I was talking about, I was scratching the record. And John, you know that, bro. <laughs> you know that. I was scratching back then. What you did in a chorus was you was like born into something, raised in LA. That's what we did. So it was like a popular cut. That at that time, cats like, uh, well, before they were NWA, Ice Cube and those guys were scratching that stuff way back when. And I knew Ice T, so I scratched this stuff. But from day one, well, put it this way I had an opportunity to move to LA, opportunities to move to Vegas. And I never did, even when Seattle was not cool to some people. But John Funches, chill, Ross Man's a chill, right? <laughs> you see how he's born, right? I got much respect for the cat because he could tell you shit from back in the day. That's real talk. But it was a competitive game back then, and Chill was one of the cats that was there from the from the early days. When I was at the boys' club, he was already at the Y. I mean, that's that's the competitive shit I love. I mean, that's the game. I love it. Can we have a microphone? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I'm very impressed with uh, the discussion that we've had about hip hop, uh, but you know, for me, um, I I really wanted to be involved in the scene, even though I'm deaf. Um, so I've noticed that there really isn't a lot of involvement from that side of the community. I know that I hear people, but what about deaf people that have been impacted by this culture? Because I really love this, and I love the music, the art. Um, and I really love rap music, but you know, I've never heard the words, but I can feel the beat. Um, and there are a lot of deaf artists out there who sign in ASL. So what is, I'm curious about your perspective about deaf community involved in the hip hop scene and, and doing uh, expression and poetry, like for example, in ASL. What do you guys think about that? Um, actually, there's a b-boy uh, by the name of Crazy Cujo, and he's deaf, and he uh, dances as well, and, and he feels the vibrations, and he, he does his thing. Um, also, when it comes to graffiti, graffiti art, um, these are elements in hip hop where you, you know, don't need all of your senses to be able to become involved. Um, the one beautiful thing about dancing is that there's no language being spoken, but when I go to Japan, I go to Africa, I go to Italy, we can have a great conversation just through our movement. So there's some elements in hip hop that you can be involved, um, not necessarily have it be whether it's uh, the music element, it could be whether the art element, the dance element. So. I was gonna say, I would be very interested in, um, in talking with you and learning how it could help to bridge that gap, especially learning that there's a deaf hip hop artist community and, and it's something I honestly have never thought about and I think that it's something that could be done very easily just with the right conversations. Mm -hmm. Same, I'd like to know, I, I never thought about that before. I guess there is um, kind of the ableist bent to uh, hip hop in general. Um, so I, I would love to know more about that and, help proliferate that if at all possible. Right. Ditto. Um, my, for me, hip hop should be as inclusive as possible. Sometimes we have a tendency to be a little exclusive. Um, I think we should be as inclusive as possible. So I, I didn't know about it either. That's the first time I've ever heard that. Right, right. And it's probably some, something that people who hear have never thought about because we've never had to think about it. Right. right. Good point. Right. Thank you all. Thank you. So, some of the topics that were brought up in this conversation about white people and hip hop is really, really interesting because I never thought of, say, white hip hop as a, a subgenre. Because if anything, that just that notion of it makes me think that it makes me think of white people and hip hop culture, like white people in that dynamic, is, as more of a, kind of a colonizing element of it. And though, and though I don't necessarily oppose white people in hip hop, I I have a lot of concern about white people and hip hop and their role within. Um, and what, 
Yeah, what are those concerns? Okay. Well, so one of the questions, one of the questions, I would say that one of the things that afflicts this country tremendously is white people's inability to see how they fit into the social context in any realm. And one of the things, one of the things that I've been talking about with a couple of people uh, is, is this idea of what white people hear when they listen to hip hop. And one of the examples that I've been using is say, you know, a, a track that seems to be immensely popular is Jay-Z's 99 Problems. And one of the things among many that he's speaking about in this song is racial profiling by the police, right? But I imagine, you know, in my mind, there'd be white people rolling around, listening to this track, bumping this track, saying, you know, saying like, yo, man, that's messed up. You know, I can't believe that's happening. Yo, it's Jay-Z, I'm with you. Jay-Z's my homeboy, right? They're like white people who project themselves onto Jay-Z, but they don't realize that where they most likely fit in, or at least what they're closer to, is that colonizing element of the police department and the racial profiling that's involved in that. So again, I think one of the things, one of the biggest afflictions in this country is white people's inability to see where they fit in into this context. And I'm wondering how that relates, or what your thoughts on that as to how white people in hip hop relate. Well, one thing that I can speak on from my own experience is I lived in the Bronx for 10 years. Um, I wasn't the only white guy living in the Bronx for 10 years, uh, or for their whole life for that matter. Um, I could count on my hands how many times I went to jail for doing nothing. I got beat down by the police. So, you know, white people, a lot of times, they deal with the same issues, and I'm not saying that they're dealing with the same issues of being black in America and being looked at in a certain way, but sometimes there are those situations where the lines are blurred and, um, you know, it's 2013, and even though, you know, it's it's out there, you know, and, and um, people are being more racist nowadays, it's coming out being more upfront, but at the same time, you know, you have to look at both sides of the story, you know? So what if there is like a white, you know, uh, side of hip hop. There's been, like I said before, there's been a Latin side of hip hop. You know, there's been a Native American side of hip hop. You know what I mean? But I think a lot of people are, they, they hear the white side of hip hop and all of a sudden they get defensive. Yeah, let, let me, let me um, to more to your point, I use my own song as an example. When I did Lady I'm Back, it's like, you know, the mix of my stuff was supposed to be fun, but there was an underlying message in the song about the acceptance of black women in, you know, basically mainstream media, period. So then I go on tour, and you're right, I started to hear a misinterpretation of what I was talking about. All of a sudden it was just a sex thing, and I, I reduced sisters to a body part, which could be said, that's, that's a fair criticism. But what I felt it was my duty to do at that point was to clarify what the song was about. The song's fun, and you sing it at weddings, and that's cool, but really what the song was about was black women being accepted as black women, not as close as they could come to being white. Um, so I, I'm not saying that's what Jay-Z should do, maybe he doesn't have the time, but for me, and I think all artists, really, when you have a song that blows up like that, it's really important to explain where you come from with that track. And I think for 99 Problems, you're right, there are a lot of cats listening to 99 Problems. That's my, you know, where they say, I hate that shit. I'm serious. I mean, I, I've been in the car with people and they'd be like, that's my end. And I'm looking at them like, when did you, when did you qualify to say that word? So yeah, we, didn't, saying, we didn't even get into that. Well, that's why I stopped saying it. Real talk, I used to say it all the time, and I stopped saying it because I realized that I was perpetuating the very stereotype that they were actually, when they're listening to this music, that's what they think. Well, because Rick said it or because Jay-Z said it, I can say it. Smart. You know what I mean? And that's, that shit hurt. But I realized that it was partly my fault. Yeah, I was gonna say somebody. Um, I don't. I don't self-identify as white. I'm half Chinese, but I know I'm perceived as white. And for me, as a young artist um, who just did it, beginning and really came into, I think, a racial consciousness, and, and really, you know, went through a process of, you know, coming from 13 to, to being a young adult, and really thinking about, okay, what does it mean for me to be emceeing? Um, I think that that's 
I think that that's where the community comes in. That's where the crew comes in. That's what separates the subgenre from the culture. Because when you, the power of hip hop is that it can take somebody who comes from a, a background of privilege and provide them a lens of here's some shit to think about. Here's some shit to be critical about. Here's what you should be analyzing. And, and so it, in that way, can really inform, um, inform and progress and evolve, I think, uh, society. I think that white, I think that you're right as far as the concerns about whiteness colonizing hip hop, but I think just as, just as important as capitalism colonizing hip hop. And I think that that, um, and I think that that's the point that I was kind of trying to make earlier as far as, you know, the white hop being a, a, a culture. I don't think it is, because I think in, in a culture and in a cultural community, you have checks and balances, and you get checked and balanced if you're out here colonizing or not being right <laughs> with, you know, responsible with your, with the artistic practices. So that's my thoughts on that. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's move it around a little bit. Just, you had your hand up there. Yeah, I just um, wanted to, I don't know if this is a question, but I think that hip hop artists and also people that um, listen to hip hop need to respect the history Roots. So I think, like, I agree with you all that all cultures can tap into hip hop and and really become artists themselves. I think that there's almost like a responsibility of recognizing the Black cultural roots and that foundation and having that knowledge and not being ignorant about that historical aspect. So it's it's. I guess I see it as there are some artists that potentially ignore that or, or profit from the ignorance that sort of pervades society. And then there are other artists that responsibly, consistently come back to those cultural roots, come back to acknowledge that oppressive framework from which hip hop grew out of. What do you, what do you, when you say that, what do you mean by coming back? I, always, I, always, I hear that a lot, so I like to know yeah, before so, I respond. So I guess just thinking about like the, the roots of hip hop starting in uh, New York with uh, the Sugar Hill Gang and, and knowing that it came initially from black culture in those spaces. Right, so what, what does an artist do once they succeed to, in your mind, make you understand that they do still respect the history of it. Because I've never met a hip hop artist, honestly, that didn't. Even the ones that people consider whack actually respect the history of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a very good question. I don't know. I don't know if I could yeah. differentiate. I think, I mean, I always tell people, like, if you've been in the game for over 10 years, to a lot of people, that's probably more close to, like, half of their life. You've been doing anything for like close to half of your life. You should know what you're doing. You should know where it comes from. You should know the history of it. And you should understand it. You know, if not, you're just kind of doing it. You're just kind of in it, your weekend warrior, you know? But, you know, if you really care about your trade and you've been doing it that long, you've been doing it over 10 years or whatever, you have, it's your responsibility to know what you're doing, where it came from. And because if you do, have the chance and opportunity to pass that on, it's gonna still have its integrity. It's still gonna be what it is uh, when it initially started out as being, I mean, take breaking for instance. Like, you know, right now, if it didn't stay to its original essence, it could look like ballet after 30, 40 years. You know, how does it stay the same? How does it keep it in integrity? By knowing the history and knowing how it's done and knowing where it came from. Look, a lot of the cats that dance on, you know, YouTube videos to dubstep, that's nothing but what he was doing 20 years ago. Exactly. So it is, it, it's, it's a tip of the hat, but I, I get your point that maybe they should acknowledge it publicly a little more. And they 
Black culture has been really effective. You know what? I'm glad you brought that up. My dad used to always tell me this. Um, a white guy can go in a store and steal a bag of potato chips. And that's a guy who stole a bag of potato chips. I walk in the store, don't touch a bag of potato chips, and I'm already suspected of stealing them. So it's, it's almost kind of a double standard to a certain extent. And I don't think it's, I don't think people even know where they do it. I think it's almost subconscious, which is actually more scary. And as to your point on, on black exploitation, um, I was, I remember, I don't want to, I don't want my friends, so let me not say that. But there was one particular friend of mine who did a chicken commercial, and I'm like, oh, bro, god damn. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, he's my guy, he's my guy, you know, and I, I mean, I understood there was a lot of bread in it. And um, I've done commercials, I've done a whole lot of commercials, um, but I ain't doing no. Right. Were, you, were you conscious? I mean, are you conscious about that kind of thing in terms of what you will choose to endorse or allow your songs I, to endorse? It's, it's how it's shot. In other words, when I did the Burger King thing, right? I remember when I showed up, they had four or five black women on top of this Butterfinger bar. I mean, on top of this burger with gold chains and tiger shorts and pumps and shit. I'm like, I'm not doing this. Real talk. And it was a lot of money to go off of me, but I got to live with myself after. So they just went and got on some different clothes, and we did it. Okay, okay, okay. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, I grew up in Eugene, listening to hardcore, and, you know, whack flag, I had a foot long mohawk. But my roommate happened to be this guy named Goldie, and he headed up the Party Boys, which had a couple of kind of famous uh, dancers and stuff in his crew. We lived in three different places together. And I felt like an outsider, too. Like you were talking about going into a store, and I'm suspecting you. I had a manager come up to me in a safe way and ask me, please don't come into our store anymore. You're scaring our customers. I thought, oh my god. So I was listening to UTFO and Egyptian Lover and stuff like that with Goldie. And when I moved up here, I found a friend uh, from East 18th Street, a guy by the name of Shady. I went in to see him, and I heard NWA. I, it blew me away. I could not believe it. Um, I've never really felt like part of your guys' culture, of course, because I've got my own culture, but I, I thought they had incredible similarities in the fact that we were both outcasts. Our music was from the street. It talked about what was happening with us as individuals. You know, there's the bad brains in the hardcore movement from the East Coast that helped start up hardcore that isn't known about, you know? Uh, I wanted to, I talked to African Bombada about him playing with Johnny Rotten. I was wondering how you guys felt about, you know, hardcore and uh, the hip hop movement and maybe the, the similarities that they share. That's extremely close to my heart. I love, I love early LA hardcore, damage, all that, man. That's, that's my shit. And I love how that, how, how that collusion that happened at that time, that understanding that you just spoke about of similarities, uh, I think is vital. I think it, it kind of went awry a few times, you know, some like really dumb rap rock shit. And um, so it's, it's, it's very hard. It's a very uh, uh, tough line to walk. And just like hip hop, hardcore is, uh, and punk in general, is just full of extremely brittle uh, and vocal cultural critics who are like, no, it's not this if, it's, if you don't have you know, the Liberty Spikes and the Leather, or this and that and this, and there's all these signifiers. Whereas I think it's more of a, a, a way you process everything that you've been given, you know, where, where you live. Um, but I, I love that. I think that's, that's, that's super important. And uh, I definitely, as I've gotten to know some of like the older heads in the rock uh, institutions out here, they talk about how they first heard Shred of the Compton in the Nirvana tour van, you know, stuff like that. So there's always been that that, that understanding, I think. And um, I think it would, I draw a lot of inspiration personally just from the stories of, you know, like getting the van, Henry Rollins is talking about going around the country and building a circuit, a tour circuit, and how they got the word out. That's very inspirational to me. That's something I think that hip hop can use. I think hip hop sometimes gets a little myopic and just looks inward all the time, which is weird because it's created from so many different things. So I think it's, it's very good to look at how other uh, subcultures have sprung up and flourished and, and flip that and use that because that is hip hop. 
Um, just real quick, just to touch on that, just like a couple sentences that um, in the early days, the reason why BAM was doing stuff with Johnny Rotten and was because in the late 70s and the early 80s, all the punk rockers and all the b-boys and hip-hoppers were going to the same clubs in New York and Manhattan. They're all hanging out together. They're all doing drugs together. They're doing the wild stuff that they do. They're all from the streets. So, you know, really there were a lot of punk rockers that were involved in the hip-hop scene and vice versa. There's a lot of hip-hoppers that were involved with the hip-hop scene as well. Like you said, Bad Brains, you know, they were black. They were black uh, punk rock group. I think I don't know about so. Okay. Yes, uh, Susan? I see the most critical part of that is taking and having artists look at look at the culture, look at their practice in the context of the world, and not just their 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 crew, their city, their whatever. Because when I think that that's especially problematic when you're talking about here in the U.S., but I think that there are so many different reflections of how hip hop is being used very successfully um, as a tool against you know as a, as a tool against oppression and. Um, Colonization, you know, uh, across the world, and I think that um, I just lost my train of thought real quickly. Yeah. I, I would, I would totally agree with Julia. I, I don't know if uh, it's being used effectively as a tool against imperialism as in the U.S. as it is abroad. I agree. It's very sharply frontlined being used in, in, in the way that, in, that, that, that Chuck D and them were always saying it, it should be. That's, that kind of got hijacked down here, just like everything got hijacked in the US. The US is a hijack. Um, but, you know, I think we need to look outside and see how hip hop is being used as an anti-imperialist vehicle and include that in our understanding of what hip hop is. And I think that that work is also, it's happening, and it's happening definitely locally. We have artists like uh, Omega facilitating exchanges with hip-hop artists from out here, or people who engage in the hip-hop community out here to, um, you know, go to Chiapas, we've had that happen. Um, there was a report, black, uh, report back, I think, at Black Coffee. He'll be out here again um, December 8th for the church that we're throwing at Black Coffee. Um, so so this work is, is being done, but a lot of the times, you know, that, that Brand of work is very, it's, it's risky, you know, and it's scary, and it's, it is the type that attracts the attention that, that we don't want. And it isn't the type that's cool and fun and people want to, you know, come party to or whatever. But I think that, um, you know, getting more support, getting more support from, you know, people, uh, people like you, you know what I mean? And, um, and I think getting the information out there and having that be a part of the discourse is going to be important. Um, yes, My question's for Sir Nicola. My mom actually told me to ask you, do you remember Sunnyside? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I remember yeah. I remember that. We couldn't go back anymore because one of my one of my guys plugged somebody. Yeah, I remember that. So we couldn't go back anymore. I really it was a fight and something happened, it's none of my thing, but I do remember Sunnyside. That was like early on in my career. It's, for those of y'all who don't who don't know, Sunnyside is outside of Yakima, and uh, we used to play a gym out there in August, and it'd be like 120 degrees on the stage. I remember that. Your mom was there? Yeah. Damn, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, final question. I was wondering, this question for everybody, I was just wondering what you guys think about integrating poetry and 
spoken word and the hip hop. You know, I'm, I was raised probably in Washington, D.C. I love what Wale is doing. And I just want to know um, when you're operating on the levels you guys are operating on, is that ground upon? Is that do people like that? And what's your guys' personal opinions as far as that? I've heard a joke amongst a lot of people who in the that, you know, they started doing poetry. And then when they started like dating people, kicking it with members of whatever sex they're into, that's when they started rapping, you know. So I think they're very closely intertwined, and I like when people have brought together in like cool ways. But I haven't really heard it in a while, at least on a national scale. Like when Kanye had Saul Williams on that song with with Mos and everything, that was that was crazy. I think that was really well done. Um, Rap and poetry is, you know, they're the same. Um, I think that needs to be explored more. I think you can definitely find, it's almost like when the beat drops out, it's poetry. It's how people look at it a lot. I think you can find that all the time, and just in, the, in, the, in those moments, like on a Killer Mike album or somebody, or somebody just really like speaking some truth, and not pursuing to a, a rhyme scheme. Um, it, that, that's, that's where that's, that's, that's really, Obvious, so you know, I don't think that'll ever die. I think people just have to push that, you know. And also, um, you know, with the early days of rapping, you know, you're talking about the last poets, you're talking about the New York, you know, Poets Cafe in Gil New Scott. York, you know, yeah. And so, you know, a lot, you know, Gil Scott Heron, exactly, you know, a lot of these guys, uh, Blowfly, you know, what I mean? it's wild, you know what I mean, but. A lot, of, yeah, but a lot of these, you know, artists, you know, who were doing poetry, spoken word, whatever, you know, they were rhyming, you know, they were, they were, you know, Muhammad Ali, yeah. you know, they were rhyming and they had cadence and, and they were really the structure and framework of what, like, rapping really is. Um, you know, all the way back to the radio disc jockeys, you know, used to do the same thing, but, um, you know, I feel that it's, it has its place and, like you said, in certain songs, it, it, it's dope, it works out. It works. And he goes back even further. I, there was an interview in City Arts Magazine. Ishmael Butler was interviewing Quincy Jones. And Quincy was like illustrating the fact if you talk to like a real old head, they're, they're talking about the fact that this rapping, this rhyming, this, this, this way of conveying info, it just goes back forever and ever and ever. You know, obviously to Africa, to the oral tradition, to the griot. But there are cats in the blues era who are, who are going off on each other like that. There's nothing new. Um, so I don't know what my point of bringing that up was, but I think that's something everybody should understand. It's nothing new. It's old. It's ancient. It's eternal. So you know, tap into that. There's power in it. As I mentioned, uh, November is Hip Hop History Month. So please uh, join the uh, 206 Zulu uh, for the Zulu Jam. Honoring the past, present, and future of the hip hop in the Northwest. It's going to be on Friday, November 29th. Old school breakers reunion, freestyle session, writer's bench, slideshow and displays, food and potluck. That'll be at Washington Hall, 153 14th Avenue in Seattle, from 7 to 11 p.m. Free, all ages. And for more information, check out 206zoo.com. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists, Julie C., Larry Mizell Jr., Fever One, and Sir mix a -Lot. I would like to thank all of you for coming out. Thank you so very much. Happy Hip Hop History Month. And if you haven't already, learn something new about Hip Hop History. Thank you. And just so you know, that the party will continue in the atrium. So we're having a... Uh, Starting at 3 o'clock, the Freedom of Art series is having a showcase for the Hip Hop History Month theme. There'll be lots of art displays and performances. So feel free to make your way to the atrium after this. Thank you.